wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know how glorious, how beautiful you So powerful, your glory fills the skies, your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to see how marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. You open my eyes to your wonders anew. Captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You opened my eyes to your wonders anew You captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one I love you beautiful one I adore beautiful one my soul must sing oh beautiful one I love you beautiful one I adore beautiful one my soul must sing my soul my soul must sing my soul, my soul must sing My soul, my soul must sing Beautiful one Good morning, everybody. Welcome everybody this morning. It's good to be able to be together. Um, good to see faces we haven't seen in a long time. Good to be able to come together. Welcome to everybody watching online at home. Um, it's an exciting morning as we, we, uh, we're going to celebrate the, the graduates that we have uh, graduating um, from high school in our, in our church this morning. Um, and yeah, just a, a good reason to be able to come together and celebrate. And of course, we always come and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we have in him and just been thinking on that this week um, the the hope that we have in him even in the midst of difficulties in the midst of trials that, that he is our hope and so I encourage you uh, in that and and while we're kind of on that subject um, there uh, is a um, as you know there's there's been several tragic suicides in our community um, and surrounding communities in the last uh, few couple months um, and um, there's a, a program that's going to be coming uh, to, uh, uh, to, to town called Mad Hope, and they're going to be putting on some presentations um, for uh, teen suicide awareness. I should have put the details up here, and I didn't because I was very distracted this morning. I had, uh, had a lot of distractions this morning. So, um, Joe, Joe, do you want to uh, share the, the details of which, I can't remember which days are which now, or do you have it off the top of your head or not? So it's the 11th and 25th. I have the dates. It was just like, which one is which? So the 11th one, uh, the, on the 11th, um, is going to be a panel of, uh, is that, that kind of teaches us how to um, recognize some of the, the, the 
uh, issues and, and warning signs around suicide, how to partner with, with uh, at-risk uh, youth and, and how to, to, to help them through that. Um, and so there's uh, two sessions, one at 9.30 uh, to 11 and one at 1 to 3. Um, so if you want to sign up for that, um, you can do that um, at... You, yeah, I'm probably going to email. Yeah, and you can pick one, one or the other. Um, and then the following, and then on the 25th, um, it's the same, uh, same group, but it's a different program where they have um, teens that, that come in and kind of share um, ways that, that they see uh, that, that we can help and partner with them. And so this is not an explicitly Christian uh, program. Um, but we like to be able to, to bring the church uh, in contact with people that are um, in that, that place and is that, that's been a, a big issue in our community. Um, and so one thing that we're doing is, is BCF is going to be providing snacks um, for those uh, all four of those sessions. There's two sessions each Saturday. Um, and so this is all a long way of saying, uh, saying one is if you want to sign up for that's great. But two, um, we also would like somebody to, that could be able to, uh, some people that can man the snack table for each of those sessions to be able to connect with people. Um, and just kind of show that the church cares about the issue of suicide in our community, that the church uh, cares about that, and that, you know, we ultimately believe that we have the hope in Christ um, that a hopeless world needs. And so um, if you'd like to be a part of that or you just want some more information or if you'd like to volunteer, um, you can talk to, to me um, uh, or Gail and let us know, and we can get uh, more information out to you for that. We'd really love to have some people volunteer for that. So... I think I said that very uneloquently, but hopefully you followed it all. So <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's see. Um, I think all these other announcements I have up here are for stuff later in the service. Um, and so let's pray, and uh, we'll move back into our time of worship. God, I know I am feeling very frazzled here this morning, just um, had lots of things that, that went wrong this morning. Um, lots of things that, that, that didn't go as I planned, God, and that can happen in our lives. And I'm sure I'm not the only person here feeling some of that, God. Um, but God, we know that, that we are here to worship you, that you are ultimately in control. And so God, I just pray for anyone that's feeling like me, anyone who's feeling stressed, anyone who's feeling anxious, anyone who's feeling worried, anyone who's feeling troubled, God, that we would just come and submit ourselves to our King. We wouldn't just go through the motions as we've been talking about as we've gone through the book of Hebrews. We wouldn't just be going through the motions of worship. But we would come and really be directing our gaze and our hearts to you. God, help me to do that this morning. Help others to do that this morning. And may what we, what we do here this morning truly be meaningful to us all. And especially to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, let's continue to sing and cry out to the Lord this morning. It's falling from the clouds, strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies Like cannons in the night As the music of the universe plays Singing you are holy Great and mighty The moon and the stars Declare who you are And I'm so unworthy But still you Forever my heart will sing of how great you are. Beautiful and free, the song of galaxies, reaching far beyond the Milky Way. Let's join in with the sound Come on, let's sing it out As the music of the universe plays We're singing You are holy Great and mighty The moon and the stars Declare who You are And I'm so unworthy But still you love me forever. 
forever my heart will sing of how great all glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. And all glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. And all glory, honor, power is yours forever. Great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. And I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of how great you are. Arise, strength of God, go before, lift me up as I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my side. As I wait, heart of God, satisfy and sustain. As I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my God, be my God. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. As I go, hand of God, my defense by my side. As I rest, breath of God, and fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Yeah. Oh. be all around me, yeah, oh, oh, Christ be all around me, yeah, sing your life, and your life, your death, your blood was shed. For every moment 
Every moment, your life, your death, your blood was shed for every moment, every moment, your life, your death, your blood was shed for every moment, every moment, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, yeah. Oh, oh, Christ be all around me, yeah. Oh, oh, Christ be all around me. in holiness worthy of praise wonderful counselor we will adore you have created us God evermore adore you we adore you lifting praises to God evermore Lord of the infinite author of time earth and the heaven seen your grand design angels in worship rejoice and proclaim you are the holy one Great is your name. We adore you. We adore you. Lifting praises to God evermore. love and hallelujah God evermore God evermore God evermore waves of the ocean deep to your will with your commanding voice storms become still all will acknowledge you and all will proclaim 
God in control of our trials. You are the God in control. May we just always remember that God. When life seems out of control, you are in control. And you accomplish your plans and purposes. And you bring all things together for good. God, we thank you for that. Thank you for all who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Christ. All right. Well, this is, as I said earlier, this is a special day that we get to celebrate. Um, so we have uh, two students um, from our congregation that are going to be graduating high school um, this year. So uh, Simon Rasmus and Emily Hayes, if you guys want to come on up and stand up here. <laughs> you stand right there, Simon. You stand over here, Emily. Um, make sure, I better pull up my notes to make sure I get this right so I don't blow, mess it up like I did that announcement earlier. That was bad. <laughs> Um, all right, um, so Emily uh, is planning uh, after school. She is, so I, I guess I should just see a little background. So Emily, um, what do you remember how old you were when you started you started to come to BCF? Do you have any idea? Yes, no, it was a long time. Nine? Nine, years. Nine yeah. I, I remember, I actually remember the exact Sunday, that you, the, your guys' first Sunday that you came, I was getting installed as the youth pastor officially. I remember that because it was like kind of an awkward service and everything. But I remember talking to you guys after that. So, But I don't actually remember what date that was because I was like working with the youth for a long time before that. So I remember what the date was. But yeah, that sounds about right. It's about nine years ago. And then Simon, Simon was about eight months old when I started attending BCF. So he's been going to BCF eight months longer than me. Uh, but so I've done lots of these little graduations before with people, but like Sam is the first one that I remember like being a baby and then like watching him grow up all those years and everything. So, um, yeah, so these are two, two students we've watched grow and change and just, uh, God at work in their lives, um, their families. And so it's been exciting to watch them grow. So I'm excited for what God has in store for, for you, Simon, and for you, Emily, um, and, uh, yeah, just encourage you guys to keep focused on him. So Emily, this was where I started to go earlier, Emily um, plans next year to go to Bellingham Tech uh, and to earn an, an associate's degree, and then she wants to transfer to Western to complete a bachelor's in education. Um, and then Simon plans to go on going straight to Western, and he's going to study music education and Japanese education. So 
Yeah. So you guys might have some classes together on the education stuff. <laughs> All right. That was awkward. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and um, if, you're, if, uh, if you guys want to spread out a little bit more and your families can come up and we'll pray around, uh, like pray, I'll pray for you guys, but your families can gather around you and, and we'll just pray over you guys. With that, I know, that's why I said spread out more. <laughs> it's up to you guys. You can decide if you want to touch them or not. <laughs> God, we thank you um, for both of these students. We thank you for Emily, and we thank you for Simon. We thank you um, for just um, the, the blessing that, that just watching them grow has been to us as a congregation, God. Um, God, I think of whenever we have baby dedications, we always say that we're committed um, to supporting the families and, and uh, supporting these, these uh, kids, and um, I think sometimes we do good jobs and sometimes we do better jobs of that but God but I believe that, that with both these families like to some degree or another God we have loved them and supported them that we have loved Emily we have loved Simon that we have watched them grow um, and that it's not just a celebration for their families watching them grow and graduate and, and, and uh, move to the next chapter of their lives but it's a celebration for us as a church and so I pray that we would uh, be celebrating together God God we pray for your blessing to go on Simon, your blessing to go on Emily. God, we pray um, that, that they would uh, go out, that they would see you at work in their lives, God, that they would follow you and your leading in their lives, that they would see your blessing on them in their lives, God. God, may they know you and love you and follow you, God. God, I pray for their families. I pray um, for, for Nate and Rebecca. Uh, and I pray for uh, Kale and Sandy, God, just as they, um, they, they uh, release their children, in a sense, on, into this new phase of life, as they move into that, just that, um, that you would just bring them joy in that, um, that there would be excitement there, that you would help them to, to parent in this new phase well, um, and just that your blessing would be on them as well, God. We thank you for these families. We thank you for the part that we have gotten to play uh, in their lives, and we thank you that uh, for the, the the ways that they have ministered to us as well, God. Um, we pray for these students in Jesus' name, Amen. And we have little gifts here for you guys. Amen. Amen. And Simon, there you go. You have to wait a few more years. Sorry, bud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so we have one other person that's going to be moving on to a new phase of life, a little bit older. Um, so, uh, Penny, if you want to come on up. So, Penny Hughes has been attending BCF for about four years now. Um, and uh, she uh, has recently decided she's, she sold her house um, that she had here in Blaine, and she's going to be moving uh, to Georgia um, to go be closer to her son, uh, Hunter. And, and so she's excited about that. And she actually asked if she could share, say a few words. Did you still want to do that? You want to do it at the microphone, those people watching online? Can you come? Penny, 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 can you come up and say it in here? Yeah, because if at home, if people are watching on the computer, it just sounds like. <laughs> well, it has been a blessing to be a part of this congregation in the last four and a half years. An absolute blessing. I have grown so much in the Lord in the last four and a half years. And a lot of it is because all of you. This is an amazing small church. And dedication to the Lord, oh my goodness. So I want to thank you, Justin, and I want to thank you, Anne, and the entire family, all of this congregation, because all of you, I've watched and observed you over the years, and I have seen people that really uh, want to do the right thing for their children, for their families. 
Their hearts are set on the Lord. That means everything. And when I came here, I didn't know where I was going to go. And I, was, I met some new friends for coffee because of one man that said, you need to meet these two ladies. <laughs> so I went to Woods Coffee, and one of them was Kay Goff, and the other one was Lila Young. And they sat there, and they said, Penny, Blaine Christian Fellowship is where you need to be. I said, okay. And that was it. The decision was made. So I'm just so grateful. Um, and um, I'm going to a wonderful place in Canton, Georgia, near my children. It's going to be wonderful because my son left at 18 and was gone doing all kinds of things. And he met a Georgia girl, and he went and they settled in Georgia. And now I'm going to Georgia. So I'll be near them, and that's going to be such a blessing. And we, have, we just love each other. So that is just so good. Um, and I'm near, not far from my brother and his wife who are in Tallahassee. I have an elementary school friend in Knoxville. And I have another little girl. This is amazing. A little girl down the road uh, in Charlotte, not too far. She found me. She was a little girl in my classroom the first year I taught. And I taught for 31 years. And she was in that classroom at High Point Academy in Pasadena. And I can look at her right now and see that lovely face. And she said, I have to find this, this teacher. I have to find her. After 40 years, she found me. So what a beautiful thing. So we've been communicating. She always sends me special things, and we, but we'll be able to meet. And I'll go to Charlotte, or she'll come to me. Um, and then my precious, uh, like I said, my precious um, elementary friend in Knoxville, that will be wonderful. So, and then I have a couple of nieces and nephews not far. And another friend from a church in South Pasadena. So there you go, and it will be wonderful. But it, nothing can replace what I experienced here in the beauty of this church, the people here, everything. It has touched my heart deeply, and I want to thank all of you. Thank you. You want to come down here, Penny? You want to go stand back over here and pray for you? Um, all right, so if anyone, well, actually, Penny, wait, wait, Penny, Penny, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. So, anybody, if anybody would like to come gather around her as we pray for her. Thank you. Stephen, you want to unmute this mic? It should be less vocal. I don't know what number it is, but. God, we are thankful just to hear uh, Penny's testimony of how our church has blessed her, God. But we know we have been blessed by her as well, God. Just her, her love for others, her love for your spirit, um, your desire to, to just see your Holy Spirit work and to see revival um, have all blessed me personally, God. Um, and just, I know many have been blessed by her friendship and just her care, God. And so we, we just thank you for, for Penny, God. She's such a compassionate heart. Um, such a passionate heart, um, and she is uh, added to this this church that, in the time that she has been here, God. And so we pray for her as she goes. Um, we just pray for blessing in her relationship with her son. We pray for blessing um, in, in the other relationships you'll make there. We pray that she would be able to find um, a, a good community of believers there in Georgia as well, that she can uh, bless as what the way that she has blessed us and that could also bless her, God. Um, and may you just continue to work, God. You, 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 may your spirit continue to lead her and guide her and bless her. And we thank you um, for the, the time that we've had with her here. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so I um, have one more out of the ordinary thing. Extraordinary thing is the way you could word it. Um, so um, if, you're, if you're not aware, uh, Joe Zechariah um, in the last year is, uh, was it about a year ago that you started, Joe, or is it a little bit longer than that? A little bit longer than that. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, but felt led uh, by God to, to open up. Uh, he had done some training as a chaplain and felt led by God to kind of open up a storefront chaplaincy um, down on uh, H Street uh, here in Blaine. Um, and so I uh, wanted to ask him to share a little bit about uh, the, the ministry there and what he's doing. And um, just as, as he's, he's put a lot into that and seen God work in a lot of cool ways and just wanted him to be able to share that with us. And so um, instead of me preaching today, he's going to be coming up and sharing about the work that he's done. Um, let's go ahead and dismiss kids for Kids Church. So walking through, uh, uh, through seven in the toddler room. Or not toddler room, primary room. <laughs> yeah. All right, and Joe, if you want to come on up. Thank you, Justin. Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, Stephen, you can put up the first slide. Stephen's going to help me today. On Thursday, November 30th, 2017, Diane began experiencing some chest pains. She called some relatives and friends and drove herself to Sharp Memorial Hospital in San Diego. As Diane walked to the emergency room entrance, she felt lightheaded and sat on a bench. Suddenly, she couldn't move her legs. Everything went dark. She fell off the bench. A patient leaving the ER reported to staff that someone had collapsed outside. An ER nurse rushed to Diane. She found no pulse and began CPR. More hospital staff arrived. Diane was placed on a gurney and rushed inside. CPR, cardiac defibrillation, and medications were administered. For 32 minutes, the staff could not resuscitate Diane. Diane was connected to a Lucas CPR machine to reduce the odds of neurological damage should she survive. All the required medical experts were alerted to the case. The team examined all options, and Dr. Joseph Belezzo, the chief of emergency medicine, determined that Diane's heart was not capable of sustaining life. They later learned that Diane's left anterior descending lad artery was 95% blocked. In layman's terms, this is called the widow maker because most people cannot survive this emergency without immediate medical intervention. Doctors Joseph Belezzo and Zach Shinar had been researching the use of heart-lung machines on emergency room patients who would otherwise have died. Dr. Belezzo quickly decided to make an incision into Diane's femoral artery, not in a surgical suite, but in the ER. Belezzo inserted wires into blood vessels to clear a pathway to her heart and then cannulated Diane, inserting tubes that would allow blood to be drawn away from the failing heart, pass, pass through a machine that provides oxygen to the blood, and returning the fresh oxygenated blood back into the body, bypassing the damaged heart and lungs. Next slide. Beep. Another long word here. This is known as venio arterial 
extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And I like the abbreviation better. It's called VAECMO, VA ECMO. It amounted to life support for the dead. This heart lung bypass allowed the doctors to surgically unblock and support the arteries so that the heart and lungs could be restarted. No one could then calculate what kind of life Diane would have after all of this. <clears throat> but 12 days after collapsing to the ground, she was able to meet with the team that saved her life and thank them. Within two months, Diane made a full neuro recovery, which at the time had about a 3% odd of happening when cardiac arrest happens outside of a hospital. But in her case, luckily, it happened outside the ER doors. And this picture is a picture of Diane with Dr. Belezzo and Casey Quinn, the author of a book called Rising, uh, Hope Rising. Next slide. So Dr. Joe Belezzo had been kind of chided by his colleagues for many years for thinking that the VA ECMO could save lives. So he says his friends and colleagues no longer laugh at him when they talk about, when he talks about real hope. And he says, quote, hope is the bridge between the impossible and the possible. In 2008, 92% of the people suffering from cardiac arrest and brought to, to the Sharp ER died. So only 8% survived. By 2014, four years after implementing VA ECMO, the survival rate jumped to 28%. Can anyone guess why there was 20% increase? Anyone? VA ECMO? Well, that's a good guess, but it's not the case. An examination of case records and data concluded that whether or not a patient received VA ECMO, there was 28% survival rate. The 28% survival rate was attributed to what Dr. Belezzo calls a, cult a new culture of hope at the Sharp Memorial Hospital's emergency department. Doctors and nurses now believed that more people could be saved, and patients and their families also believed that hope is the bridge between the impossible and the possible. Next slide. So I won't go into a lot about this. Some of this is in that book that I mentioned. It's not necessarily a book about faith. Actually, the authors have faith backgrounds that uh, were abusive, actually, in some cases, it's sad. Um, but they recognize there is element of faith. But they talk about a thing called willpower, which they give a fancy term, agency, and way power, new pathways that help people to reach life goals. There are now over 2,000 scientifically peer-reviewed studies on the science of hope. It's an actual science. Hope is not wishful thinking. The studies concluded that, and I quote Casey Gwynn, one of the co-authors, hope is measurable, hope is malleable. He went on to say hope changes the world. So if you could put up the next slide, Stephen. I share all the information, this information regarding hope because at the very foundation, the gathering place in Blaine, where our office is on 8th Street, provides people in sometimes what appears to be desperate and impossible times hope. We offer hope. Which brings me to the subject of adverse childhood experiences. I'm not going to go into the full explanation of this chart, but there has been many studies that started in the U.S. and around the world about adverse childhood experiences. And there is a simple questionnaire that breaks down the different types of abuse and neglect. 
and rates people uh, with a score, an A score, from zero to 10. There's um, now thousands of research papers on this. Uh, talks of you know, smoking, alcoholism, IV drug use, heart disease, suicide attempts. And if you look at the chart, the one I want to zero down uh, in on is the very bottom. So the no ACEs reported, one in 96 people, that's the general population, will attempt suicide. To the far right, with people four to 10 ACEs, one in five will attempt suicide. In scores of peer-reviewed studies around the globe, evidence shows, on average, a person with a high A score will have a life, their life expectancy cut by at least 20 years. We apply hope to many situations, and we see reversals in some cases that appear hopeless. There are many impacts to sin in our world, and I think of the many people that suffer from ACEs, abused and neglected, and they are many. And I don't think you could fathom how many people there are in our community and across our nation who suffered terrible trauma, abuse, and neglect in many forms. Sadly, some perpetuate their abuse in their adult relationships, ending their lives addicted, incarcerated, or dead. People with a high A score can go on to experience major health problems, physical health problems. They struggle with sometimes mental health issues, addiction, depression, PTSD, and the high rates of suicide in person to the general population. ACEs is the biggest public health threat crisis in America and the world, and we never really hear about it. Next slide, please. But there is hope, and it was by, I believe, God's wise design. Hope, the impossible becomes possible, so God created the brain, and he created a way for pathways in the brain to change and be healed from past trauma. And this science is called neuroplasticity. It's where the brain can actually change. It can open new pathways. And um, just as a side note, 80% of your brain, the cortex, stops 20% of the brain, the limbic system, that tries to tell you what to do. So there is no excuse uh, to not change unless we have deeper issues and we can seek professional help for that. Uh, Dr. Chan Hellman, the co-author of Hope Rising, was in a community center and observing a young man that everyone seemed to gravitate to. He was full of life, and he gave spark to everybody around him. Then Dr. Hellman learned this was the young man that he was supposed to evaluate that day. This young man spoke excitedly about college that he had now enrolled in and what he would study. Dr. Hellman then learned that the young man had recently been diagnosed with HIV AIDS. His parents threw him out of the house because after learning about his diagnosis, he was homeless, but he had hope. The young man saw the possible in the impossible. And Dr. Hellman said, that day changed my life, changed my practice. I stopped looking for a diagnosis or what's wrong with people and started to look at what is right with people, what they're doing right, and build on that. So I'm here to tell you today that many have experienced healing, hope, and building resiliency in their lives in our community. It happens when they took a step of faith, entered the gathering place, and shared what for some had been inside them for 30 plus years. 
the horrendous hurts, pain, trauma they experienced at the hands, mouths, or actions of another person. Some people came to us struggling with severe depression, sometimes exacerbated by mental illness. They struggled for many years, and some stayed in bed 15 to 18 hours a day because hopelessness led them to believe that there isn't much outside to get up and live for. We have been able to offer them hope, and we have seen the impossible now become possible. We've seen them get out of bed, and get active, and be excited about life. It's come over time. It's not an overnight thing, but we've seen it happen. Studies prove that the brain that God created can build new pathways. Brain scans of Syrian refugees showed large, dark areas when they were first rescued. A few years after being out of the war zone in school, receiving counseling, and some had been adopted, new brain scans were done, and the dark areas were gone. Replaced with healthy brain tissue, God's miracle of neuroplasticity. The brain literally rewired with connect, new connected pathways for, in new and healthy ways. Next slide. At the gathering place, we also see people that come in that are sick and tired of life-controlling substances or other, other addictions. They're stuck, and they need to become unstuck. That's what mental health coaching is all about. There are some who would never allow these people in their offices because of the level of high or intoxication they're in. But at the gathering place in Blaine, we invite them in because those folks are far more valuable than our donated furnishings. Some people return multiple times because they're just not ready for the change. But the system is also slow in getting them into care, or a boyfriend or girlfriend keeps them captive in a cruel bondage of addiction. Or they don't see the new pathway right now. Some have lost custody of their children because a substance holds more power over them than their young children that they say they love. I'm not going to sit and judge that, but I can report to you that some are now on a continuum of hope. I can also say in, with confidence that in one big case, a person is now clean and sober, praising God for dramatic changes in her life. Hope came down and made the impossible possible. It was the big July 4th weekend, 2021. Some people extended their weekend by taking Friday off. Others were planning to leave work early. It was a very slow and quiet day at the gathering place in Blaine. I was starting to think myself about leaving the office early. A person, sorry, person known to me, who I will call Hope, came to the gathering place. Hope was extremely intoxicated. Hope was middle-aged and came in tears because an emergency room doctor told her that she had two choices in life. Number one, keep drinking and die young. Hope was up to two bottles of wine per day, ramped up due in part to the pandemic. Or, Think more seriously about getting sober and living longer. We talked and hope wept. We prayed. Then I grabbed my phone and called around to see what resources I could come up with on the afternoon of the biggest holiday weekend in America. While I was calling around, Hope said she needed fresh air and stepped outside my office. I was busy speaking with a treatment center and frantically taking notes. When I was able to go outside, I realized that Hope didn't just step outside for fresh air, she was gone. 
hope sunk into a feeling of feelings of the impossible. I found no signs of hope in the area even after driving around for about an hour. I returned to the office. Hope had disappeared and remained so for the next two and a half hours. I was about to give up and leave for the weekend, but I sensed I should stay. A few minutes after that thought, Hope reappeared at the gathering place. She was now more intoxicated than the first visit. She was hoping, uh, having more drinks in, in a bar when a relative called and said that she was calling the police unless her car was returned now. So, with prayer and help, we returned the vehicle. Hope gathered a travel bag and we drove out to Marysville. We were at a treatment center waiting in a lobby and they called us in, did some testing, and they said they could not offer us an assessment because Hope's level of, because of Hope's level of intoxication. No assessment, no treatment. Our only option now was the Skagit Regional Hospital's emergency department. We went there and Hope tested four times over the legal limit when we arrived. She could not be evaluated or placed into a detox facility with a blood alcohol level that high. You must be practically sober for the system to allow you into detox. <clears throat> the doctors gave Hope meds to help with detox withdrawal and we were put into a treatment room for many hours. It was a very busy ER as we waited for sobriety. During our time, many serious cases arrived, codes were called uh, over the PA because horrific accidents and various traumas from the weekend were rushing in. We were forgotten about for many hours. I stayed alert while hope drifted in and out of consciousness. Occasionally, in between ER chaos, I would check in with the nurses, and occasionally they do a test. As of Saturday morning, as the sun was shining bright outside, which we couldn't see through the cinder blocks, hope was still over two times the legal limit and needed to be much lower. With a lull in trauma cases, a doctor discovered that we had been there all this time without much attention. So the doctor, had, she administered an IV drip with electrolytes to flush the alcohol out and speed sobriety. 16 hours had elapsed and the hospital social worker now arrived on duty. Hope was still intoxicated, but with the social worker's signed referral, I was able to drive Hope to a, a nearby detox center. Less than 30 hours later, I would be advocating hard with medical authorities to extend the detox bed past the holiday weekend. Hope was about to be discharged on a holiday Monday in America's busiest party weekend without a place to go and no inpatient treatment. Many calls and prayers later, a sympathetic detox supervisor joined our advocacy, called his superiors, and extended the bed. Over that weekend, three to four people in the detox center lost hope. They signed themselves out and went binge drinking in pubs nearby. Several tried to return a detox. One young man returned later that day intoxicated and begging staff to get back in. I was at the front door to give some staff some things for hope. This young man was crying and distraught, talking about his two young children at home needing him sober. But it was not going to happen for him that day. He was intoxicated and all the detox beds had been filled. But Hope stuck it out and thrived in her first sobriety in years. 
Little did, I, did we know that despite 23 empty inpatient beds out in Cedro Woolley, the system was very slowly returning after the holidays. Two new and updated assessments, many calls, lots of advocacy later, and now we had to find a sober home for Hope to be discharged in. Hope would remain at the home of a long recovered friend, remaining sober for the next two weeks. We texted, we met up, we walked, we talked, we prayed. The system was slowly getting back to work. After the two weeks, we secured a 30-day inpatient bed in Tacoma. Hope graduated from the program and has been sober for almost a year now. She made this painting for me while she was in detox. I don't know if you can read the bottom, but it says, prayers go up and blessings come down. It's one of the most um, prized possessions in my office. And I'll never forget July 4th, 2021, when the impossible became possible. Oftentimes, these cases, and let's put it bluntly, they're the lives of real people, impact the people around them in a big way, not to mention me. Some folks come alongside us and help us meet some needs. Sometimes BCF will greatly help us meet a need or split a cost. At other times, CAP and other community organizations join in. Multiple times now, God has sent us refugees facing harm and death in their homelands. They had U.S. visas and fled to the U.S. seeking asylum. They passed through the door of the gathering place to receive doses of compassion, love, concern, action, advocacy, and hope. Impossible situations that now look more possible. Most times, the possible comes about just as these people are filled with despair. I always believe that in those situations, hope will soon rise. The impossible will become possible. One day, I was in a conversation with Justin about a case we partnered on and saw the miraculous. The miracle after miracle that was performed for this person, they will never be able to deny. Neither would uh, those around him who witnessed it all. Justin remarked and called it collateral grace, and I really think you should write a book on it, um, and how it impacts everybody on the periphery. And people came to know the story and were touched. The impossible suddenly became possible, and grace just spilled out all over Blaine and beyond. BCF was very instrumental in the case, as always. Next slide. In August of 2021, through a series of God-orchestrated events, I met who I will call Will. Over 100 people some 6,000 miles from Blaine were riveted and jolted by the miraculous stories Will was sharing with them. As far as I know, these people were all non-believers, and they were now hearing about Jesus through this outpouring of hope that broke through tremendous darkness, pain, and anguish the impossible becoming possible. They all thirsted to hear more of this story day by day. Will, reading a Bible to understand why we we're doing so much to help him. Reading God's word about love. On the very morning, while we were facing a huge roadblock that was about to be blown away, Will was extremely depressed from all the bureaucratic mess that we fought for weeks. Will said he felt like he just wanted to be dead. And he asked if he could leave my office and go to his rented room that we had secured up the street. 
I knew that if I allowed him to leave the gathering place that morning, something terrible would happen. I knew in my heart Will would take his life. So I sat him down in my office and I told him that in the weeks we were together, I had not demanded anything. But today was different. Today, I would not allow him to leave or to be alone. And my answer was no. I shared God's love for him, my love for him, and I told him that as we spoke, I was 100% sure that God was working on a solution to this problem. And I told him we would see it very soon. We prayed, we studied scripture, and peace came upon Will. About four hours into that peace, we learned that an extremely important government document had been delayed in getting to us by a glitch in the Canada Border Services Agency email system. As I recall, the timestamp on the original email was around the very time that I had that crisis meeting at the gathering place with Will. That document was an invitation from the Canadian Deputy Minister for Immigration advising Will to present himself to the Canadian port of entry in Blaine within 24 hours to be processed for asylum. Will entered Canada on the appointed day, and a few weeks later he attended some hearings, and he was eventually granted full asylum status in Canada through a series of major miracles. This is a picture that I snapped dropping Will off as he walked into Canada. This picture will forever be etched to my mind. Twenty-seven days, and then the impossible became possible. God had already heard our cries and answered our prayers. And just like I told him, he would. Yet, we didn't see it as fast as we wanted to because of a government email glitch. Not long ago, my friend Pastor Ivan preached here at BCF about the power. Hope and his power are not just wishful thinking or some name it, claim it theology. There's actually they're proving a science behind the power of hope and that hope is a real thing. I like what the Weymouth New Testament has to, um, the translation of Hebrews 11.1 1 from the Weymouth New Testament. It says, now faith is a well-grounded assurance of that for which we hope and a conviction of the reality of things we do not see. We didn't see the email for hours, but it was there, and it was very real. At the gathering place, all of this happens not because of a nice office that God furnished and provided for. This all happens because of God's love and grace and for his glory. The author of hope came down for us and is with us. If we keep our eyes on him, we can see hope delivered. So we listen, we love, we work, we offer hope. We trust God for him to make the impossible possible. Next slide, Stephen. Because Romans 5, 1 through 5, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, 
and character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame, will not be put to shame, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Next slide. Last year at Christmas time, a lady in the community called me on the phone. I'll call her Hope. Do you see a little pattern emerging here? Hope heard about this chaplain downtown and wanted to know more about the gathering place and what we were doing. We had a lovely chat and I could tell that her and her husband really loved Blaine and quietly did many serious things in speaking, uh, uh, sorry, uh, many, many major things to help our community. As we chatted, we laughed, and at times we got very serious in speaking of God's uh, people's pain many times over for the next hour and a half. A few days after, a card arrived, and inside was a generous donation to the gathering place, and a nice note that said how much they appreciated the work we are doing and to keep it going. Since that day in December 2021, Hope and her husband have been our single, biggest single monthly supporters. Each month, a card arrives. Hope like, likes butterflies, as you can see. Most of the cards have butterflies on them. And each card contains a beautifully handwritten note of encouragement with month's monthly support that we never solicited. I always replied to the card with a little note on what we've been working on in general terms to respect privacy and thank Hope and her husband for all they do in investing in us. A few months ago, I made it a point to send an email to Hope to let her know that I greatly appreciated them and was thinking about them. I also mentioned in my email at that time that if I can ever pray for them or their family or their friends, I would be happy to do so. I also told Hope that I was praying for her that day as she came to mind. Next slide. Hope replied to my email, Joe, Thank you for the information and your thoughts of prayer. I believe that the prayers for now belong to the Ukrainian people. I am an atheist, but at times like these, I do pray that there are gods somewhere to help all people who are in need. Thank you, as always, for your kind work and words. All the best. Hope. Little did Hope know, but on the day her email arrived, as well as when several of her cards arrived with specific messages that she penned, I was struggling with helping to see the impossible become possible. I was feeling tired and worn out. I was wondering when, after all this work, the impossible would be possible. I sat in awe and still do that a self-identified atheist would see something powerful in our daily work, that Hope and her husband would send beautiful cards with encouraging notes, along with investments of their hard-earned money on a consistent basis to keep our work alive and blind. Not only did Hope send money, but her words ministered to me and encouraged me on some days that seemed pretty void of hope. Many times I had wept reading Hope's heartfelt messages and the thankfulness and concern that they had for the lives of others. God powerfully humbled me the day that that email arrived. Thank you, Hope. To repeat the quote of Dr. Joe Belezzo, a man of faith, by the way, hope is the bridge between the impossible and the possible. Next slide, please. And that reminds me of Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope. Next slide. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given joy and peace in our believing. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can abound in hope. We can see the impossible become possible, and we can help others to see that. So this is a chart, not sure how well you can read it, but in the back table is a brochure on the gathering place with a copy of this that you can read. At the gathering place, we do many things. All depends on who God sends in the front door. Life coaching, mental health coaching, food assistance, help with government programs, much, much more. So the reports are on the back table if you'd like to know more. However, the greatest thing that we can do is to be agents of hope to those in need, trusting God that the impossible will become possible. Next slide, Stephen. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you, BCF, for your prayers, support, and co-laboring with the gathering place. Many more people have been helped during the flooding, pandemic, trauma, and crisis, and for some, what was the worst day of their life. All possible because of your partnership and your love. We believe the impossible is possible. We offer hope to those God puts in our path, and I really, Thank you from the bottom of my heart, church. Thank you. Um, just a minute. You can sit down. You can sit for a minute, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So Joe's not special. Um, I, I don't want to remind you of that because often, like, I'm challenged a lot by Joe, and he does have an amazing gift of connecting with people and, and hurting and has comp- a great compassion for him, but he's not special. Joe is available. Um, and when we are available, God can use us to accomplish wonderful things. Um, and so I hope that as you hear Joe share, there's two things I hope you take away with. Um, um, one is... Um, if God's stirring in your heart and you'd like to support uh, Joe and the work he does, I know he, he'll end up a lot of times giving from his own personal finances and everything to try to help people out because of that compassion. And um, BCF is a church. We've started supporting him $50 a month, um, which isn't a lot, but it's, you know, every little bit helps. And so if you'd like to support him, you can do that. I just uh, added um, on to the church giving page where you can, uh, like, if you uh, pay on the website that you can add a donation there, you can do it one time or recurring or stuff like that, and we'll get that to him. Um, so that's one thing you can do, but, and that's great. If God started you to do that, you should do that. But the bigger thing I'd like for you to take away is, is just to be available, um, that God can do wonderful things through us when we're available. And so let his, his Holy Spirit work in you. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Be willing to be pressed to your limits. Be willing to um, to do things that, that you wouldn't otherwise think you'd do. But, but let God work in you and be available for him to work. And I'd encourage you with that. Um, and that's why I think that God uses Joe in, in lots of those ways is because of his willingness and availability. So... Um, yeah, with that, that message of hope, I was, I was also thinking, you know, he had the slide at the beginning that talked about that hope comes, um, isn't just wishful, but it's when, when there's a will and when there's a way, then we have hope. Um, when we see that, that when, we, when we want something and we see a way for that something to happen. And then that just brought to my mind Philippians 2.13, that it says, it's God who works in you both to will and to work, that God gives us the will, gives us the way. And so for us, we have hope, and we remember that at the cross. And so I'd like to close with communion and just remembering, kind of tying, I guess, everything together, the, the hope we have as a, as a body as we come together, as we grow together, as we celebrate together, as we encounter people and are available people in the world, as we go out with the gospel together, that it all comes from the hope that we have by the, the cross of Christ, the, the, who, who wills and works in us. So Joe, if you want to come up. Hey, communion, Kale, do you want to come play? 
Um, you can come uh, get uh, get these cups, these pre-filled cups, take them back to your seat, and then hold them, and we'll take them together uh, in just a minute. So Joe read from um, the verse in, in Romans, from Romans 5, that you know talks about us rejoicing in our sufferings, and eventually it produces hope. And then right after that it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And just that reminder that our hope comes from Christ. Our hope comes from the God who had a will and a work to obtain our freedom from sin, our freedom from death. And so, God, we thank you that you have given us hope. That in our darkest times, our darkest hour, God, that you sent your Son to die for us. That by your will and by the work of the cross, that we have hope in our lives. We take this bread and we say thank you for the hope that you have given us. And God, we know that the cross does not just give us hope in our own personal lives, gives us hope for the world. Hope that you have overcome darkness and death and evil in this world. Hope that we, by your Holy Spirit, can work for something better. That you give us, that you, your Spirit wills and works in us and gives us hope, not just in our lives, but in this world. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that accomplishes that hope. God, as we reflect on this today, I just pray that by your will and by your work, that we would be available, that we would let you work through us, that we would both see and seize opportunities for your grace to flow through us, God. That we would all have stories where we see you at work in us, not because of our greatness, but because of, our, of your greatness 
and our willingness to allow you to work through us. In Jesus' name, amen.